Hi, my name is Giovanna Kloss and I'm a senior at the University of Montevallo. Today, we're going to be talking about education in 1920s Alabama. But first, some background. In 1917, the United States joined what would become known as World War I. During this war, the United States military had intelligence tests that draftees were required to pass. Large numbers of draftees from Alabama failed these tests. This embarrassed Alabama greatly, especially because six northern states had blacks score a higher average on the beta intelligence test than Alabama whites. This embarrassing number of failing draftees, combined with Alabama's low ranking for literacy and school attendance, influenced Alabama to put an increased focus on education. Thus, in 1918, Alabama elected Thomas E. Kilby, governor of Alabama, because of his platform of reform, including education reform. You might be wondering how bad education was really in Alabama in the early 1900s. In 1918, a study on social progress in Alabama showed that Alabama spent nearly a third per student as the national average. The average teacher salary was over $200 less than the national average. Students attended school 36 days less than the national average, and there were very few good schoolhouses outside of the cities. In 1920, almost 18% of the population of Alabama was illiterate. During the 1920 school year, white urban schools in Alabama operated an average of 174 days, while white rural schools only operated an average of 123 days. Black urban schools were fairly close to white urban schools with an average of 170 days, but black rural schools only operated an average of 87 days. Under Governor Kilby, education in Alabama made noticeable improvements. From 1919 to 1922, funding for education increased by over 100%. The number of schools also increased with schools becoming more modern. In 1927 alone, 167 new schoolhouses were built. Funding for the Boys Industrial School, the Vocational School for Girls, and the State Training School for Girls also increased. In 1926, Bib Graves won the election for governor of Alabama, and he also focused on reform throughout the state. He received funding from the legislation that universally increased the school year to seven months. They also put taxes from tobacco products and corporations towards funding education. Under Governor Graves, teachers' pay increased with the average teacher in the 1926 to 1927 school year making $689, to the average teacher during the 1929 to 1930 school year making $761. This increased salary is still less than $12,500 in 2021 dollars. The 1929 legislature made over 22 million more dollars available for public education than the 1923 legislature had. One of Governor Bibb Graves' most impressive goals was to consolidate small rural schools into larger schools with more qualified teachers. Montgomery County Public Schools was one of the first countywide consolidated school systems in the country. They got rid of all the one-teacher schools and got down to only three three-teacher schoolhouses, with all the other schools in the district ranging from six to 25 teachers. By 1929, the county paid for the transportation of 1,800 students for nine months every year. Now, all these improvements are great for school-aged people, but what about adults who never had these opportunities? This is where opportunity schools come in. Alabama started opportunity schools to help solve the problem of adult illiteracy. These schools lasted for six weeks and taught pe people basic school subjects like geography, reading, writing, health, and math. These schools helped a lot of people, including those in rural areas, with nearly 3,400 people between 16 and 80 enrolling in 1927, over 2,000 of which were enrolled in rural areas. Over the summer in 1927, nearly 600 white people between the ages of 16 and 20 learned how to read. People who enrolled in opportunity schools had different goals. Some people only wanted to learn how to read the Bible, while others only cared about learning how to sign their name. During the summer of 1929, opportunity schools operated in the prisons with the goal of el el eliminating illiteracy from black and white prisoners. 
These schools began with around 1,200 illiterate prisoners, and by the end of the six weeks, nearly 500 of them were successfully taught how to read and write. The Prison Opportunity Schools had about a 40% success rate of teaching literacy, which I think is pretty good, and overall, some Opportunity Schools were more successful than others. In 1929, Blockton Opportunity School had 124 people enroll, of which 29 were illiterate, and by the end of the six-week course, all 29 were literate. During that same period, Shady Grove Opportunity School had 20 illiterates, of which 10 became literate. Frequently, these people worked full-time while attending Opportunity Schools in the evenings. A teacher's account from a 1925 Opportunity School in a coal mining district talks about a class struggling because of a lack of supplies, and the class banding together to bring lamps and oil so they could see during their nightly classes. This teacher mentions a lesson on geography where the class had a very hot discussion about the world being flat. These classes provided wonderful opportunities for adults to learn basics that we think of today as common knowledge, which was not so common a hundred years ago. Vocational schools were another kind of school that helped educate Alabamian children as well as adults. Vocational schools had courses in agricultures, trades, industries, and home economics. Over 1,500 adults gained training in part-time and evening classes offered by vocational schools. Both Governor Kilby and Governor Bibb Graves increased appropriations for vocational schools. All of the increased money going to education meant increased taxes for Alabamians, which some in the state strongly disliked. Some school districts had to close earlier at times because the county did not collect enough taxes to fund longer school years. Large corporations and landowners had increasingly large anti-tax sent by 1927, which prevented a $20 million bond for school construction from getting passed. I found a telegram conversation in the Montgomery archives from 1928 quite humorous, so I decided to share it with you. On February 25, 1928, W.M. Welch sent a telegram to Governor Bibb Graves, which read, The Garner School closed yesterday, with only four half months. Please investigate this matter and let us know why at once. On March 1st, 1928, Bibb Graves replied with a telegram saying, The Garner School closed because your district failed to collect a district tax and therefore cannot participate in the Equalization Fund. This conversation shows us that Governor Bibb Graves meant business when he told districts to collect taxes. The state was not going to help schools which didn't want to help themselves. You may be wondering what was the point in all of the increased funding for education? Does it really make a difference? Well, by 1930, the literacy rate has de had decreased to only 14% from the nearly 18 it was at the beginning of the decade. Alabamians still had shocking lo shockingly low levels of education throughout the 20th century, with less than 60% of Alabamians 25 or older having completed high school and only 67% of graduation-aged people in Alabama having received a diploma in 1986. In 1990, Alabama ranked 10th highest in high school dropouts. In 1996, 34% of Alabama adults did not have high school diplomas. 456,000 adults in Alabama could not read above a ninth grade level, and 93,000 never completed fourth grade. These statistics seem bad, but considering where Alabama was in 1920, we can see how Alabama had improved greatly over 70 years to make it this far. In 1996, the National Report Card noted that 45% of students were performing at or above national average, an increase from 40% in 1990. By the early 2000s, Alabama ACT scores still were less than the national average, but Alabama was outperforming many of the other southeastern states. For the first time in 2000, every Alabama public school reached or exceeded the national average in every grade and subject on the SAT. Now that we have gone over the slow but substantial increase in education, you may wonder why does quality of education make a difference? Well, the social consequences of low levels of education can be very apparent. 
1989, 90% of Alabama's 13,000 prison inmates had not graduated high school. Also in 1989, over 65% of food stamps and welfare expenditures went to high school dropouts. That shows the generational cycle of poverty that a quality education can rescue people from. Quality education is needed to improve people's lives. Do you guys remember how I mentioned some people who enrolled in opportunity schools only cared about learning to read the Bible? Well, education was important to Alabama Baptists, so you should stay tuned for next week's podcast where Jacob Gross will tell you about Alabama Baptists' views on evolution.